Hello everybody, we are here in Frankfurt for the PROSCA meeting which summarize, try to summarize the new data and the evidence base we have on treating prostate cancer and nowadays, especially today we will discuss a little bit about castrate resistant prostate cancer. Let's start with you immediately about CRPC. We all know the definition of CRPC and recently two papers were published on M0 CRPC. The second one was just published yesterday in New England. So there are two questions for you. The first one is, does this stage exist in 2018? And second question is, are you convinced by postponing the METs in the M0 CRPC? Yeah, very good questions. To come to the first question, I think first of all it's a matter of how you do the staging. When you use conventional staging, bone scans or CT scans, um, we do know that the, the risk of detecting metastasis is much lower than, for example, using newer imaging modalities like the PSMA PET scan, which we do have um, available in Germany in many, many um, hospitals. That's why sometimes clinicians or patients um, do this outside of clinical trials just um, because they're available. And we all know if the patient wants something very hard that sometimes we just do it. I think in very, very rare cases, it might be that the stage of M0 CRPC does exist. And, but in the majority of the cases, I'm quite convinced that there are occult metastases somewhere. The good thing about the new studies and the new medications is that we are moving away from the scenario where we say we have to wait till we can see metastases in whatever imaging modality we are using. So we move away from this from this quite frustrating scenario for us as treating physicians and for the patients to say, well, we have to wait till we see metastasis, even though we are quite convinced that there are somewhere metastasis, but we just can't prove them because the, the licensing um, trials for enzalidomide, abiraterone, and the other substance always said it's metastatic castration versus prostate cancer. So um, to come to your second question, I think, first of all, this is Apart from, from the oncologic data, I think it's a, a good psychological effect for the patients to know that we can do something apart from just waiting for metastasis to occur. If I'm convinced um, from the primary endpoint, metastasis-free survival, um, as I said, from a psychological point of view, I think this is a very valid endpoint. But if you look at the secondary endpoint, symptomatic progression, this was statistically significant as well. So I think this is an even more valid endpoint. And if we see um, the, 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 for us, most important um, secondary endpoint, the overall survival, which is not statistically significant yet, but it was only an interim analysis where only, I think, around about one quarter of the patients needed in the prior calculation already um, had an event, they died. Um, so I think these data also on overall survival are very promising and within the next one or two years, as you already said in the sec session today, I'm quite convinced that this endpoint, which is the most valid one, will also be significant. Amit, uh, if I got the point correctly, M1 disease is just a matter of definition of which tool you use. So M0, M1, it's almost the same if it's the RPC. Yeah, and you know, you talk to all the um, sort of uh, radiologists who are specializing in all these new technologies, uh, the word that is coming out, which I, I say it, but it's not a joke. It's like M0.5. <laughs> like, you know, it's how, what do you want to detect? And what is your policy? And I think, I think in some ways, this will make us think what are we trying to investigate? Why are we trying to investigate it? What will it make us do, right? Now, if, like, you know, let's say Spartan with apalutamide and Prosper with enzalutamide, now, you have a patient who's progressing, there is no evidence on CT and bone scan, and you believe the data, and I agree that the, you know, overall survival might mature and come out, like, you know, but at this juncture, you're absolutely right, the symptomatic progression was important and metastasis-free survival, in my opinion, is very important. Because psychologically, I'd rather my patient was in a metastasis-free state, whatever way we define it, than actually develop a metastasis. It's a changing situation for the patient's acceptance. 
So if I want to do that, I'll stick with CT and bone scan and give them one of those drugs. But, you know, but in the past, when you didn't have that option, then maybe you were keener to do all the newer investigations to be able to show that you're dealing with M1 CRPC to be able to give them the abiratron and enzalutamide. I think one very interesting thing, which whilst we consider Spartan and Prosper to be very equivalent studies, they are for the start of it, but Spartan actually, you know, the, had the option after apalutamide of being given abiratron or another drug, but majority got abiratron. And, and it's almost like understanding that do these drugs actually work after uh, apalutamide? Because the question that will always come now is that the earlier we bring enzalutamide or apalutamide, does it leave us only with chemotherapy after that? in the real world or radium 223 but you know uh, so are we taking out those options and i think that i would like to see in the update of these trials as they come along because i'd really like to see we, even though we saw the composite pfs like you know but you didn't really understand the exact benefit that was coming from the abiratron in that setting and that's something that will because how do you decide which drug you will give there is a different side effect profile but the efficacy seems quite similar. So you need the data, not just from side effect and efficacy, but also sequencing, you see. That's correct. Do, do we agree that the evidence so far that Abby after APA I don't is think not we there? Got, no, I not don't think. Yet. No, not there. Uh, I don't think you've got the evidence to make a statement, put it in a guideline or recommend it. Like you know. Second point to both of you, are all M0 CRPC equal? Are they all the same? Or are we just discussing here a subgroup of M0 CRPC? They're not all the same. You know, everyone who's treated prostate cancer knows that they're not all the same. You have a patient who's M0 CRPC, you keep on scanning them, keep on scanning them, and nothing happens over months, even a couple of years, right? And then there are some patients who are you know, within a spate of three months, actually develops such frankly metastatic disease that you kind of look back and go back and check the previous scan and you see there wasn't disease there. So, so they are not all the same. And, and you almost look at these studies and the point is, see, the drug works in, worked in M1 CRPC. Was it a surprise that enzalutamide would work in M0 CRPC? Absolutely not. Like, so it's almost, the the drug to be given to the patient who would otherwise would have progressed quite rapidly you know where you can afford to wait i would still potentially wait and see what happens to their disease trajectory at that time point what i wanted to highlight and that's a question for you that they're not equal not on m0 crpc are equal but the data we have are there only for those with a doubling time of less than 10 months and most of them had a median PSA doubling time around four months. What the hell with those with a longer PSA doubling time? Well, I mean, I think probably we just don't know. We do know that it works for patients with a high risk of, of metastasis. So we, we do know that a PSA doubling time below 10 months is one of the strongest risk factors for the development of metastasis within the next month. And I think that especially these are the patients who have a need for for treatment because as we discussed before we don't know maybe they are these are maybe the the, the patients who are already m plus crpc but we just don't know so that's why i think it's quite quite um yeah obvious that these are the patients who need the treatment patient with a very slowly rising psa um I mean, we do know that they will not um, develop metastasis so early. We do know that they have a better quality of life then. So I think it's, it's um, similar to, to, to other debates. We should treat patient risk adopted. And I think patients with a high PSA doubling time are the ones who profit most. Well, the message is very important, but I want to highlight thing, something. It's absolutely true that the benefit is, seems to be there for those with a rapidly progressing PSA, so individualized treatment. Just remind everyone, salvage ADT, salvage ADT is probably only useful for those with a rapidly progressing PSA. That's not the case. That's not how it's used 
worldwide. So we have to reinforce it's probably correct for a subgroup M0 CRPC. The next step will be M1. Let's say we have M1 based on bone scan and CT scan. We are facing a question of rich people. We have a lot of drugs. Million dollars for you, Amit. How do we select? You see, the, this question gets asked so many times. Now, unfortunately, we don't have level one evidence to say the sequence of you know, docetaxel followed by abiratron followed by cabazitaxel is better than do, uh, abiratron followed by docetaxel, whichever way. So I think the important message here is what is that we make, need to make sure that patients can avail life prolonging therapies when they are fit enough to get those treatments. And so it doesn't matter what you give to them as long as you've explained to the patient that, you know, I need to monitor you. The question is not only about whether you get just oral therapy or chemotherapy. The question is whether you get oral therapy and get monitored and when you progress you get chemotherapy or if you get chemotherapy then you get monitored and when you progress you get oral therapy and keeping a close eye on that so that their performance status doesn't deteriorate to the point that they cannot avail the next treatment. I think nobody should be able to question that at all and as long as people do that then you will see that survival has improved. People question whether we've improved survival by sequencing. Well, you have to look at the trial results for TAX327, where median overall survival was 18.9 months in the original publication, became 19.2 in the updated. But the trials of enzalutamide and abiratron all going in the 30-month plus range, you see. So uh, clearly with cabazitaxel also, if you look at from date of start of first docetaxel chemotherapy, median overall survival is 29 months plus. So you have improved survival by sequencing. We will know a bit more when the other trials like PEACE report. But I think by the time we get to know that, we would be dealing with the situation of the patients having apalutamide or enzalutamide in the earlier setting. And then we would say we have no knowledge of what to do after that. You know. Yes, I just want to add maybe one or two points, but I mean, I completely agree. Um, I think what is always very important as well which might be even more important in the hormone-sensitive metastatic um, setting, but also in the castration-resistant setting, is that you also have a look at the, at the um, life circumstances of your patient at the moment. For example, if you have a younger patient who still wants to run his own business and maybe he doesn't want all of his workers to see that he has a metastatic um, uh, uh, prostate carcinoma, maybe for this patient, for example, it would be better to start with abiraterone or enzalutamide because then he can more or less with some side effects uh, continue his work. As you already mentioned, window of opportunity is a very important thing. If you have someone you think well now he might be fit for chemotherapy but in maybe one year or two years he might be not then you should start with chemotherapy but the same thing applies for radium 223. If you have a patient and you think well he might progress within the next two years to visceral meds, maybe then you should um, go with radium earlier. But as we have only very, very weak data, um, we, can, we can't really put up the optimal sequence, but the most important thing is that patients get as many therapy sequences as possible. So, of course, this implies a regular uh, staging as well, because you have to know when, when to, to switch your treatment options. Your both of both raised a very, very important point. We need to involve the patient in the decision-making process. And it's by no means a black and white situation where there's a very, very clear answer for everyone. It's the patient must be involved in the decision-making. Both of you also said we have to follow. Could you clarify how to follow and when to decide to switch? Well, I mean, that's a difficult but very cru crucial question. Um, we all know that from time to time the follow-up is not sufficient enough. So I think we all know patients who come back to our outpatient clinics with the last imaging modalities run maybe one or one and a half years ago, they are um, showing up with symptomatic like bone pain or whatever. So I think in the CRPC setting it is even more important to do regular bone scan and CT scan compared to the hormone sensitive 
um, sector because in the home incentive setting we do have the PSA value still as a quite good parameter for progression. But we know that in the CRPC setting around half of the patient um, do progress to Vistra and METS without a rising PSA. So I think the first very important statement is you should not do the follow-up alone by um, clinical examination of PSA. You do have to do CT scan and bone scan on a regular basis. If this is every three months or every six months, I think this is something, or if the patient is doing well, maybe nine months. But this is something you have to discuss with the patient. You have to decide if you rather think that really he will progress within the next uh, three to six months um, or not. And I think it is also very important to do a complete staging. So not like say, well, the last time I did a CT scan, this time I do a bone scan, and in six months I'm doing a CT scan again, or maybe a PSMA pet in between, because then you just can't really compare if there's a progress on that. So I think, to make the point, it is very important to do a conventional staging on a regular basis, maybe every six months, and to do a complete staging so you can really compare to the other time points. And when do you switch? When you switch is always the most difficult decision to make. And one has to realize that the guidelines say that two out of three criteria, you know, the Singalan consensus, etc. So biochemical progression, radiological progression, and clinical or symptomatic progression. But actually, two out of three seems quite straightforward. But unequivocal radiological progression, which is clinically meaningful, warrants a change. You cannot sit back and say patient is not in pain, patient's PSA is stable. In fact, probably the patient is developing the most aggressive variant of the disease. So, so you, you have to be very mindful of this. And well, I fully agree with the, you know, the concept of monitoring the patient. I always emphasize one point. First and foremost, if you have established your goals of treatment with the patient, your monitoring comes with it. Because if you know that this patient has got other two lines of treatment available, then I should be monitoring this patient on a regular basis then there is no excuse. What is the excuse of not doing the scans as per the guidelines, right? If you know that there is another line of treatment available for the patient. But if there is no other line of treatment available, then you become, okay, you do the scans based on symptoms because you are then managing it in that sense. So if your goal of treatment, your discussion with the patient and your options guide you to proper monitoring, then you use the monitoring tools radiologically which you have or your department has the expertise of reporting. There's no point ordering a whole body MRI if you don't have a radiologist who can read it, right? So just go with your CT scan and a bone scan. Personally, I would be very happy with CT scan with bone windows actually, because unless, you know, you, you, you and you can do it on a three monthly basis basically. If you have the facility of doing whole body MRI or, or doing PET scans, fine, but don't mix and match. It's better to be with one investigation which you are comfortable with, which your unit can report properly and do it that way rather than, you know, mixing and matching. Probably you heard a very important message because both of you said the same thing. Do medicine. That means discuss with the patient, interact with the patient. There is no magic button where you press and you have the answer. You are, it's always an interaction with the patient. So probably that's the most important message of all the session of today. So thank both of you. and. Hopefully you enjoy the session.